Oh, is this fun or what? I get to wake you back up again. This morning when we woke up, each one of us took a breath. And you can thank plants for the oxygen in our air. Did you sleep in cotton sheets? Put on a cotton t-shirt? Cotton's made out of plants too. <laughs> Cheap breakfast. Bagel, toast, cereal, oatmeal, croissant. It comes from grains and that comes from plants. Orange juice, fruit, plants. Coffee, tea, plants. Drive to school in a car. Gas comes from oil. And oil comes from millions of plants breaking down over millions of years. Do you sit at a wooden desk? Do you write on paper? You play baseball with a wooden bat? I think you know where I'm going. All life depends on plants. Our cities are getting denser. They have to be because population is increasing. And 80% of the world's population in developed countries live in cities. And this is a jungle of concrete and steel, disconnected from nature. Urban living can be a good thing, the concentration of goods and services, living close by your work, the close proximity of people means ideas exchange more rapidly. There's an alternative to that concrete and steel jungle, and that's living architecture. When I talk about living architecture, I hope you don't think I mean something like this. Because <laughs> I think they should have pruned those trees just a couple of years ago. <laughs> the images I want you to think of are something like this. Or maybe this, and this. Richard Liu wrote a book a couple of years ago, and in it he points out the disconnection between our young today and nature. And he quotes a fifth grader, says, I'd rather play indoors because that's where the electrical outlets are. <laughs> I played outdoors. I was real lucky, I got to go out with my dad and my grandfather and we spent time in the woods hunting and camping and fishing and looking for arrowheads. And my, my grandfather was a, a self-made naturalist and he was a plant enthusiast. And constantly I'm getting quizzed on what kind of tree is this, what kind of plant is that. But I learned at an early age a very strong love and appreciation for nature through their love. At 20 I'm going to college and taking art classes. I'm a little unconventional in my approach to art and I get a job at a plant and flower shop downtown San Diego. And within a couple of months, they decide to sell. And I go home to dinner that night, and my dad shocks me and says, let's buy it. In a month, we're in business. And I'm here to tell you that selling a perishable product outside is not a simple business. And so when I saw the opportunity to open an indoor landscaping company, I jumped on it. And here I saw that intersection between nature and art. And immediately I say, hey, we're supplying to our clients living art. But I looked a little deeper into what indoor plants do inside, and it's fascinating. In a workspace, productivity goes up, absenteeism goes down from plants. Students do better on tests. And in hospitals, when patients have a view of a landscape or plants, they recover more quickly. They use less pain medication, and they complain less. There's a lot of studies that show this. This is pretty interesting. Years ago, Dr. Wolverton did studies for NASA, and they showed just how well plants will take toxins out of our indoor air. And amazingly, because our buildings are sealed up these days, indoor air can be more polluted than outdoor air. The off-gassing from carpet and drapes and paint and computers makes it more unhealthy. This is truly a living, breathing, biofilter wall. It takes bad air in through the front, filters it through plants and roots and, and leaves, and pumps good air out the back. So business is pretty good. My wife and I built a big house up by Barona. Because of my background in the environment and nature, I made it sustainable for, before sustainable was really a word. And that whole house vented through a cooling tower. And we had solar water heater, my laundry and shower water watered my garden. 
and I collected plants, and I built this front walkway with a pond in it. Life was good. And 10 years ago, I go to bed on my birthday, and a few short hours later, the cedar fire would take my house. This will set you back a little bit. But my first thought really was, scrape it and build a new one. Unfortunately, my wife's first thought was, let's get a divorce. <laughs> That's not funny. These are dark, dark days. But in the back of my head, that that does not kill you makes you stronger. That that does not kill you makes you stronger. I wasn't going to let this take me down. And so I did a very, made a very costly decision. I stepped back from my business and really began to explore. Say, what's next? I got a do-over. What's new? And I remembered a few months prior to that, I'd seen what's called a green roof modular tray. And this is a plastic tray about four foot by two foot. And you plant it with low-growing plants. And you put these up on top of a rooftop times 100 or 1,000 or 10,000. And I honestly thought, this is the stupidest thing I've ever seen. Why would you do that? I didn't know it could look like this. And when I asked architects what they knew about it, they were more interested in what I knew about it. That resonated. So I asked a friend of mine, McCray Anderson, and he made it real simple for me. He said, it's nothing more than a very large, shallow pot up on top of a roof. And all the things we've been doing, growing plants in confined spaces, and waterproofing, and getting people and material in or on a building, that's all what we do. Well, it's not quite that easy, but it simplified it in my mind, and it made me go forward. And as I looked around, I realized green roofs are pretty, but they also clean the air and add oxygen and cool the building down and cool the surrounding buildings down. And they process stormwater in a way that it doesn't go out and is, is runoff and then turns into pollution. And it adds habitat. I talked to a couple girls earlier that said, ew, bugs on your roof. Bugs and insects are a good thing. And so is this an island of habitat or stepping stones for birds and insects? And I think one of the neatest things, you think about all this unused landscape up on top of a roof. You can grow food up there. A rooftop farm. A couple of years ago, Iron Chef Mario Batali came to me, his team said, hey, we want to put a rooftop farm on our pizza restaurant up in Hollywood. A retrofit on an existing building is very hard. There's extra weight, the waterproofing has to be nearly perfect, safety issues, access issues. And so I came back to them and said, why don't we build a vertical farm or an edible wall? And they loved it. And this turned into a lot of other work. And pretty soon I realized, full circle. I'm designing and building living art. And then again, I went back and said, why? Well, plants on buildings clean the air much more efficiently than buildings do by themselves. And then they'll help cool that southern side of a, of a building. And yeah, it's habitat for insects. And they're just plain pretty. So who would have thought that journey that started out with a love of nature and an appreciation for art, a little business sense, would get San Diego Magazine to name me one of their eco-warriors. <laughs> My son did this image for me. Don't worry, I'm not going to bust out in tights and a flowing cape anytime soon. I'll save that for a little later. Did I hear do it? <laughs> Today, I want you to think of the possibilities. And in a small or a very large eco-warrior way, what can you do to bring plants into your life or those around you? I can show images all day long. These are so beautiful. It's a rooftop farm. Look how big that is. So take with you, please, and remember, plants are essential to life. They're beautiful, they're art, they're easy, and they're an inexpensive way to improve your life. Thank you.